Welcome to the 8 Steps to Financial Fitness with Old Mutual. My name is Suchaba Gleba and I am your host. In our previous workshop, we sat down with Khonzi who talked to us about the importance of establishing an emergency fund and what you need to do to do one, where to put the funds in your emergency fund and how to go about replenishing should an emergency occur. Today we are sitting down with Smoni Songumalo who is the Head of Equities at Old Mutual Investment Group. Welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So our topic today is a relevant one and I think one where we tend to blur the lines with, mm -hmm. you know, when we talk about assets and investments. Yeah. So I need to ask this on behalf of a friend. Please do. Is my LV bag an asset? Ooh, that, that is a good question. Um, primarily because at home, you know, I, I am married to this individual who has a few of these and they sit there at the top and how I ultimately um, describe these assets that she speaks about. You know, I said, you know, in the lockdown, what, what did your assets do for you? When you couldn't take them out and go anywhere with them? Because actually when we really, I mean, jokes aside, bring it back to reality, I, I think actually the coronavirus and the hard lockdown was a good test for what is an asset and what is not. And so therefore, if you couldn't drive it, was it really an asset? If it sat on the shelf there being displayed only for you to see, was it really an asset? Because actually, asset, I mean, it's a, it's a big term, and, you know, and we do misuse it, but it's an accounting term. And the one thing that matters about what is called an asset, it, it, it's this thing of it has economic benefits, future economic benefits. And so therefore, if its value in the future will be likely higher than it is today, then that's what an asset is. Okay, I'm, I must say I'm a little bit heartbroken, but <laughs> thanks for the clarity. But now you need to explain to us what is an asset and what isn't an asset. Okay, thank you, Sister I, mean, I liked your initial start of the question because you were asking for a friend, but then it ended up you Who's being the heartbroken friend? one. <laughs> but, but that's okay, that's okay, that's okay. Um, when we then have to decide, like, what is an asset? I mean, I think the, the simplest thing, again, so uh, a property. Property is probably the easiest asset to think about. Although even with property, there are some nuances and you've got to really think carefully about it because property is something that actually over time generally increases in value, provided you've bought it at the right place. But the trick about property that we often misuse is that property that you live in, actually isn't income generating for you. So it isn't an And asset. so therefore it is an asset, okay. but it's not really the kind of asset that we were talking about here. Okay. Now the assets we talk about, so we take um, investments or, or shares. So what are shares? Shares are companies, they go and list on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, and a share is part ownership of a company. And so if you buy part of Standard Bank, maybe 0.001% of Standard Bank, you buy a share on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Now, if the profits of Standard Bank grow over time, or Capitec Bank or South African Breweries, or whichever company it is that you know, then you get a share in those profits in the okay. future. Which is why then as long as those profits continue to grow and as that company continues to succeed, the future value that you're going to get is bigger than the price you paid for it today. Okay. So that is an asset. And again, something else that is an asset is, is probably a government bond or even companies issue bonds. Now, what is a bond? A company issues, I suppose it's a debt instrument, which again sounds complicated, but when companies need to raise money, they come out in the market and they say, I will give you a promise that says it's an IOU and where they say, I will pay you 10% a year for 20 years. And we see this with, in banks with fixed deposits. That's what a fixed deposit is. It says I'll pay you 7% for 32 days, for 64 days, however many days it is. That again is an asset. Why? Because there's a future value that is probably higher than its present value and you will get some sort of income from it. Okay. And so those are assets. So what is then not an asset? Well, most cars are not assets. Why? What do you mean most? Well, most cars. So the cars that typically you and I drive, well, unless Chaba, you drive something really special that you bought in the 1950s that's called a Porsche, generally everything else is not an asset because the minute we buy it, we know that we're going to sell it for less. So that tells you that's not an asset. Anything that you, when you, you pay today and, and you sell it tomorrow or a year or five years from now, and we've all done that. That's not an asset, you know. Um, and so that's not an asset. And again, clothing items and things jewelry. that we use. Jewelry is an interesting one because 
in theory, the price of diamonds actually does increase yeah. um, over time. And so, but is it an asset that you're going to earn an income of and get wealthy of? No. no. And so therefore, that's not again the kind of assets that we say builds wealth. Because what kind of assets are we talking about here? We're talking about assets that will help you build wealth later. That will help you either pay for your kid's education, okay. either go on a holiday, whatever, a dream retirement holiday later, buy a massive house later, or whatever it is. Those are the assets we're talking about. And if it doesn't help you achieve those, then, then in a sense is probably, it isn't. Okay. Yes. All right. All right, Spony, so, so what is the dif difference between saving and investing? If we use a, an analogy here, but first of all, I mean, I think, I think if we just define what saving, saving usually has a short-term goal orientated to it. So you are saving so that you can buy, like I know I'm saving now so I can pay for my son's school fees in January. Mm -hmm. So that's saving. It's got a short-term goal. I can see that goal and it's in its near term. Investing is building long-term wealth. I'm going to buy something, an asset, that is going to incrementally give me some form of return, probably on a monthly or six monthly basis, that five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, will be much bigger than the price then that I've paid for it. And so those are the differences. So it's, one, it's basically short term versus long term, and income generation versus very little of income generation. I suppose if you, if you use um, a sporting analogy, um, so saving is a bit like a sprint, like a 100-meter sprint, like the same bolt thing where you move from here to there. You can see where you're going when saving. It's clear. No one needs to negotiate with you where the finish line is. But it's there. And, and, and when you know when you're finished, because then you've accomplished your little sprint. Mm -hmm. Now, investing. You never, no one starts an ultra marathon or a comrades marathon seeing the finish. The no. finish is far. And actually, everyone also starts strong. This is actually a, maybe a good analogy to explore because when you're doing these big marathons, everyone starts strong and enthusiastic. And it's the same in terms of wealth creation and investing. We start, but actually, as time goes by, the discipline of trying to stick to it starts coming through. In that now you're like saying, oh, maybe this is not as going. There are other distractions. Now you're like, okay, fine. Am I, am I really going to stick to this plan? Is it going to pay off? But actually, the beauty of a marathon is that one step ahead of another, and you'll trust that if you keep going over the peaks and the valleys and whether it's raining or it's shine, whatever it is going on, you keep going until you'd reach your goal. But you never see your goal from yeah, where you are. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. You're not leaning on seeing the finish line. No. So it's mainly a trust and faith. Yes. Not faith, trust. Yes. That if you keep going and you keep taking the right steps, you will be rewarded and you will get to the finish line. Okay, okay. So isn't buying investment assets only for the rich? Because I think when we speak about investing, and I said this in one or two times in the previous mm. workshops, it, it can be mm. it can be daunting hearing yes. of the term because yes. people think, I, well, I don't have money. Where yes. am I going to start? Yes. So is it only just for the rich? No, it's not. And, and you know what's amazing about this particular question when we think about this term investing and we make it big we say no it's for rich people who want to invest uh, but actually when I again was growing up my mother used to invest in a stock fell and, you know, and there were two derivatives there was the one where they got food every month so you pulled money yes. together and they got food they still do at those the end now. of December exactly yeah. and so that's actually what saving looks like because they were saving every month and in December they'd go to one of these big discount shops and they'd buy food in bulk and they'd get good deals and and then at Christmas, we'd have a wonderful Christmas. Mm -hmm. There was another stock fell that she did with her friends where they saved money. And then they put that in a fixed deposit or long-term thing. And then they'd get more money because the money would build interest. And then they'd split it and they'd share. So now this is what we're starting to talk about. So okay. to me, this is already happening. It's just then what are the products that people are investing in and thinking about? And so therefore, wealth has nothing to do with whether or not um, it's called, um, I suppose, investing. So the way we look at investing, we say, you know what, true investing, if you look at over the long term, people have really, really done well. Actually, they've bought, like, again, shares in businesses. Mm. Now, how do you do that as a normal person? Mm. When I started working, this is probably 2005, I bought what was, is called a unit trust. I paid 500 rand a month, and a unit trust is a pooled vehicle where an asset manager, like the one I work for, um, the asset manager takes all the money that they get from people, all these 500 rands that everyone contributes, and goes out there and then goes and buys shares in listed companies, big businesses, where I get to share in the profits. And so 
Therefore, why is that a great investment? Because my 500 Rand that I contributed from whatever, 2005 up until now, I think it's worth over close to 300,000 Rand now. Okay, I haven't done anything. I don't have to look after it. I don't have to do anything for it. Somebody else is looking after it. And so, therefore, when people, we say investing, pay attention and ask about unit trust. Unit trusts are a good vehicle because you get to buy into companies and successful businesses. The same businesses that you're shopping in. So to me, if you're going to buy the Louis Vuitton bag, okay, why also don't you just buy the company that makes Louis Vuitton? I think because people are going, how do I have access to that? Ah. Where would I even have access to owning shares, yes. even if they're minimal? Yes. In a company like Louis Vuitton. And I think that's what we need to address. Yes. Hence, I say it's daunting. No one knows where to start. Brilliant. And that's a very good question. Now, the company that owns and manufactures Louis Vuitton is called, and the name is going to be interesting because we consume these things. It's Louis Vuitton Moe Hennessy. Mm -hmm. So that's the company mm -hmm. that does all those products. And that company is listed. Um, and how do you access that? Well, actually, there are unit trusts that buy this company, that invest in this company. So if you find a reputable asset manager and you ask them, how do I get access to this particular company? You know, and how do I buy that particular company? They then will tell you and you will have part ownership of that company. So people must ask. I think it's all, that's why I suppose we always encourage financial advice and you should always challenge your financial advisor and say, well, how do I access that? This is what I'm interested in in because to me I think if you like the product and this is simplicity of True. investing if you like the product and you consume the product there's nothing wrong in that but actually why don't you invest in it because ultimately when it comes to investing especially in equities and in companies what we do we look at companies where the product is loved by people more people start buying it and actually it starts doing really well that means the profits are increasing. If the profits are increasing, if you've bought a part of this company in your unit trust, you also, your wealth is also going to increase. So no, for you don't only just get to consume it, but you also get to enjoy the fact that you're benefiting from this. It's also a product that you believe in. Exactly. And that you spent money in. Exactly. In any case. Um, so let's speak about the four major assets that grow your wealth. Could yes. you take us through those? So we've spoken about, about unit trusts, which is which shares. We also then obviously have spoken a little bit about property, but not the property that you live in. And so that's why I think sometimes we talk about investment property. The property you live in, um, I think sometimes we, 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 we forget the complexity of that. Because when you live in something, so you pay a certain number for your property, and then, but you only sell it years later, and you sell it a little bit, but you've forgotten the amount of money you've spent in your transfer duties and maintaining it and reno renovating it, when you sell it, you never say, oh, how much have I spent fixing it? So actually, the, the value we get from your own properties that you live in is always deceptively higher in terms of a return than we think it is because we don't add up all the costs. So then, but what is a true investment property? It's a property if you buy an apartment and you rent it out to students or rent it out to other people. Now, that's an investment property that brings you rental income every month. And again, that's a good test for an asset. Does it bring you income every month? Does it bring you something? Because again, if you go back to unit trusts, unit trusts bring you, companies pay dividends. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to get dividends. You're going to get regular sources of income, which you can then reinvest in that particular asset. I suppose another thing we can talk about, I suppose, again, we did talk about, I was say, government bonds or company bonds which promise you interest every single month again you getting interest every single month so so those getting are something the, in yes return. you're getting something in return as well as building it's get it's growing and five years ten years from now it becomes bigger than what the contribution that you have put in so those are the major assets that I think we would um, explore hmm. and why is it important that investors understand the difference between these assets because sometimes we can blur the line yes. blur the line and it can sound, sound like the same thing. Yes, because the idea of assets is to get rich slowly. Mm. And I think uh, the, the, the problem that we have as society is the idea that I want to invest it today and I want to get something tomorrow, tomorrow or next or month. Next or something. Yes, mm. but the idea of investing in an asset. So if you think about it, if you take a company, um, you... You look at a company, a company takes time. People start, they open a small business. It becomes slightly bigger and slightly bigger and slightly bigger and it, and it keeps growing. So that person becomes wealthy not over a day, but over a long period of time. Even if you look at your own career, you don't start and then suddenly ascend to the top. It takes time, it takes effort. And actually investing is exactly the same. When you're investing in something that is worthwhile, you've got to give it time, but it'll surprise you because 
the more time you give it, especially, this is why we talk about assets, why it's an asset, a good asset will just keep giving to you and will really get better as time goes by. So, so that's where I think the difference is. So to me, assets are about investing in delayed gratification. Okay. And the way I think I would say it is that in life, actually, you've got, you've got two decisions to make. It's either you're going to play now and pay a price later, or you're going to pay the price now and play later. So now okay. let me just no, break right. that down a little yeah, bit. Please do. So <laughs> playing now, if you take your money and you only you do is you spend it on consumption. So you consume your money, you have a good life, you spend it all. I'm not saying don't spend any, you must spend some. But if you spend it all, at some point you're going to retire and you're going to say, ooh, how, what are you going to... What do I have to show for yes. this? And all you know, the work. Or you're going to have a business opportunity to pursue later, but actually what are you going to... Or you have kids and now you want to send them to university. How, how are you going to pay for that? Now that's because you've actually spent and you've played now. Now you're paying the price later. But if you decide to start investing today in good assets, now you're paying the price now. 10, 20 years from now, that child suddenly wants to go to university. Oh, you've got the money. Why? Because you paid. So now you can play. Or you want to now buy whatever it is that you want to buy, whatever, some mansion, some amazing car, whatever it is. But because you've paid the price early, you can play later. And in life, what's always amazing is that the people that we really always admire that sit on these top 10 lists of billionaires and whatever, are generally the people that spent their early 20s and 30s paying a price that in their 40s and 50s has landed them on the list that we admire. So... Pay now and then play later. And we're thinking instant gra gratification, which exactly. is not the case here. Yeah. So how do I buy investment assets and how do I start investing? Yes. Say, I know nothing. I haven't done anything. I'm speaking yes. to someone out there who is stepping into their first job. Yes. Someone who perhaps has sh moved from different jobs yes. and is in their 30s but was yes. found it a little bit intimidating. Yes. Where yes. do they yes. start? That's cool. I think as I said er earlier on, the natural inclination is actually we all know wherever you come from, we've seen some form of investing and saving. It's just that we haven't thought of it as investing and saving. Like I said, when I grew up, my mother used to invest in this stock fell and the food one and, and the money one. Th they were actually doing the same thing. But how did she end up there? Well, she asked a friend and then the friend asked, then, then the ladies came together and they put this thing together. But it's the same here. It's just that now, obviously, the products are more sophisticated. That's why we say, you know, you've got to find a financial advisor. You've got to, any of these reputable companies, even at Old Mutual, if you, there's a number there where you can call. We will send you a financial advisor because a financial advisor is going to look at you and say, let us look at your, your earnings. Let us then say, oh, okay, how much of it do you spend? Because you're going to spend some, you must enjoy your life. Okay, how much of it should you save? What are your goals? What are you trying to do? So if you are 20, at 30, maybe you want to get married and you want to buy a house and you want to buy a car. At 40, maybe your kids are now going to go to university, etc. So they're going to plan your life for you. And once they've planned your life and they've seen, okay, these are the goals that you have according to your specific goals, then they'll bring that back and say, okay, these then are the products that you need to be invested in. They'll take care of all the jargon and all of that. All you need to do is have a conversation with them. So phone them, have a conversation, ask the questions. The thing is, I think sometimes in life we get intimidated by money and the terms in there. But actually, when it's your money, you have the right to ask all the so-called stupid questions that you want because it's your money. And at the end of the day, if you ask all the stupid questions, you'll realize there's wisdom in those questions because you're not the only one who's asking these questions. And after you've asked those questions, then every month and you've made your investments, you will get a statement. And your statement is actually an amazing thing because it will say you invested this much and this is what it's grown to. And, this, and actually, then you can start holding that person who advised you to account. Because if that money is not growing over time, you say, well, what did you put me in? Why? Explain yourself. Okay, I want a better return. I want this. Oh, my lifestyle has changed. I now no longer want that house over there. In fact, I want it now in the Maldives. Okay, oh, bigger dreams. So therefore, how do we get there? And so to me, you've got to get advice because you've got to look at investing in the holistic sense of your own life. And then you've got to follow that advice and be disciplined and patient in adhering to it. I love it. Sponiso, thank you so much. I would say in closing, though, could you maybe just give us just three, three, three things that we can take out from the session? Investing is about, is about time. And why I say time is that 
we talked about assets. A true asset gets better in time and proves itself in time and makes you richer in time and its value increases in time. So you've got to have time. Now, if you have time, you're going to need patience because the one thing that we struggle with as people is that actually allowing our investments to grow takes time, but we need to be patient and let our investments grow. Yes, we must check our statements when we get them from our company to see, hey, where's my pension? Where's that? How is it growing? So again, so we've got time and we need the patience for that time. But at the end, also, we need the ability to ask, ask. So to me, is you've got to be curious. It's your money. You've got to ask questions. And again, it's always fascinating if you go on YouTube and ask, again, all these people that sit on this billionaire's list and go and, and, and read about them. One thing that these guys have always done is be insanely curious. And so therefore, we must be curious. So if you want to get wealthy, you must go and find somebody and ask them, huh? how does this happen? How did you get there? What did you do? Because all of these principles are out there. And so for me, time patience and then be curious enough to go and seek the information thank you so much Sponi. so this has been so enlightening it's a pleasure all right i think the one thing that we can take from that is that ladies if you're looking in your cupboard and you're telling yourself you have numerous investments we kind of just know from today that it's not quite the case but i love the fact that Sponi so explained what an investment is what an asset is how you can go about acquiring um, the following and one thing i can say is that i'm thinking of things differently I hope you are too. We'll see you at the next workshop.